juice, some juice said, okay, yeah, we have to learn the proper German. <laughs> and then, all right, we'll learn proper German, get rid of Yiddish, and then we'll be accepted. Mm -hmm. It's all delusional. Mainstream media gives you the impression that there is nothing good about America. In direct contrast to that, my podcasts will prove by examples that America has always been and still is the land of opportunity for everyone. Hello, and welcome to another episode in the series Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. My guest today is Dr. Kenneth Levin. As you will learn, he has a very distinguished career and truly deserves to be addressed as Dr. Levin. But he's also a very nice, unassuming guy and prefers to be called Ken. Ken has more degrees than I thought possible for one person. He earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Pennsylvania and both bachelor's and master's degree in English language and literature from Oxford University. He then went back to the University of Pennsylvania where he finished medical school and earned his MD degree. That's not all. Next, finally, he went to Princeton where he earned a PhD in history. With both a PhD and an MD, he is not just Dr. Levin, but Dr. Dr. Levin. I'm rather envious of Ken's academic credentials, but with degrees from three different universities, I don't envy the number of emails and calls that he gets from their fundraising departments. So what has Ken done with all of that knowledge? Well, he's written three books, all nonfiction, dealing with various aspects of psychiatry, one of which is entitled The Oslo Syndrome, Delusions of a People Under Siege. It deals with the issue of why Israel agreed to enter into the Oslo Agreements in the mid-90s with the Palestinian Liberation Organization, agreements which clearly were not in Israel's best interest. We'll talk about that in detail a bit later. Following the publication of that book, Ken wrote numerous articles regarding Israel in the Middle East, which have been published in the New York in, in the New Republic, the Boston Globe, the Washington Times, and the Jerusalem Post. But his books and articles didn't pay the rent. For four decades, Ken had a day job at Harvard Medical School, where he was a clinical instructor of psychiatry. And he currently maintains a private practice in psychiatry in his home, near his home in Newton, Massachusetts. I usually spend an hour with each guest, but given that Ken's a psychiatrist, I'll try to finish in 45 minutes to leave some time for him to prepare for his next patient. Ken, thank you for finding the time to join with me today. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bob. I'm very pleased to be here. First, we're going to explore your education in your medical practice. Then we'll dive into your interest in the Middle East. And finally, your current focus on anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism, especially among the so-called progressive Jews. From your academic background, mathematics to English, literature to medicine to psychiatry, one could conclude, Ken, that you loved learning but you didn't have any particular focus. So what's the story? Well, I went through a public school system in a, in a big city, and I believe I got a very good education there, uh, all things considered. But uh, when I arrived at college, I realized that uh, there were gaps in my, large gaps in my education, things I didn't know, things I'd like to know. And when I was uh, before in public school, I was not a great reader. So it wasn't that uh, I added that much to my uh, what I learned in public school. And so uh, I decided this was my opportunity to begin learning uh, with a different kind of seriousness. And I also had the idea, uh, came from various directions, that whatever one's going to do in life, one ought to start out doing mathematics. It trains one very well for uh reason thinking, systematic thinking. And so it seemed natural to get a first degree in mathematics. 
And uh, the next thing was I had an opportunity to uh, go to England on a fellowship to go to Oxford and uh, shifted to the humanities end of this degree in, uh, in English language and literature. Went back to medical school. I really, I had a place in medical school before I went to England. I really was interested in psychiatry and thought I would wind up in psychiatry. And uh, after the first year of medical school, I realized, thinking of what interested me most, the various interests that, for example, mathematics, what I'd done, uh, the uh, areas of uh, theoretical math, were mainly uh, areas that were developed in the 19th century. And the literature that I was most interested in, romantic literature, romantic realism, uh, related uh, literatures, uh, were 19th century literatures. And even psychodynamic psychiatry was a discipline developed in the 19th century. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to explore uh, 19th century intellectual history, history of science, cultural history, to some degree, political and social history? And that's what got me to Princeton. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> uh, are you still practicing now? Medicine? Uh, I'm largely retired. What's happened is that, and I've not accepted new patients for several years now, but there are some patients, there are some patients that are in situations that I feel uh, was not appropriate for us to terminate. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. so I've continued with a handful of patients. Now, are there, uh, for those patients or even those in the past, did you specialize in any kind of, any particular kind of psychological pro problems? Uh, not particular problems. I saw a whole range of uh, patients with all kinds of difficulties. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do was most interested in doing psychodynamic psychotherapy. And uh, one also has to uh, use medications where appropriate. But I basically am interested in, in psychotherapy, enjoy doing it. And uh, that was the focus of my practice. Mm-hmm. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Ken published a book in 2005 entitled The Oslo Syndrome, Delusions of a People Under Siege. Ken, you coined the term the Oslo Syndrome because of its similarity to the Stockholm Syndrome. But many people don't know what the Stockholm Syndrome is. So let's talk about that first. Well, the Stockholm Syndrome and, uh, derived from a situation that arose in the Swedish capital uh, in the context of a bank robbery, a bank robbery that went awry, and the robbers, along with several hostages, were locked into the bank vault for several days. Mm -hmm. And when they emerged, people noticed a particular sympathy for the among the hostages for their captives, for their uh, hostage takers. Mm -hmm. And that initiated the concept, uh, the term, uh, uh, so, uh, so, sorry, Stockholm Syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from what I've read, and I'll give a Cliff's Notes uh, to our readers, uh, or, or we'll call it Bob's Notes, the Stockholm Syndrome is a known psychological phenomenon in which individual hostages or victims sometimes develop feelings of trust, affection, or even sympathy towards their captors or abusers, despite the dangerous or abusive conditions that they were subjected to. It's a phenomenon that affects individuals. Whereas, Ken, your prom premise is that many Israelis, as a group, develop sympathy for the Palestinians because they, because they, the Israelis, have been under siege by the Palestinians and other Arabs for decades. And because of that, they perhaps identified with their enemies and entered into the Oslo agreements, which were clearly not in their in interest, hence the Oslo syndrome. Is that about right? Uh, expand on that. Yeah, it's essentially right. The issue is, as I saw it, that it's common among chronically besieged populations, whether you're talking about minorities that are denigrated, marginalized, mm -hmm. attacked in various ways by the surrounding majority, or small states under chronic attack uh, by the uh, by larger neighbors 
that in, almost invariably elements of that popu- those populations embrace the indictments of their attackers hmm. and seek to placate them by essentially trying to reform the community to accommodate the indictments or in other ways uh, propitiate the attackers. No matter how absurd, no matter how bigoted, no matter how outrageous the attacks might be. And the reason for that is that they are essentially feeling helpless in the face of the attacks, and they want to Mm -hmm. declare for themselves or establish for themselves a belief that they have some agency in this relationship, in this uh, Mm -hmm. relationship of attacker and attack. And so they try to ascribe themselves some responsibility in order that if they address that, they could hope thereby to change the circumstance. The paradigm in individual psychiatry is the situation of chronically abused children. And when you're talking about chronic abuse, uh, you're typically, not always, or largely talking about parental abuse. People who work with such children, particularly younger children, or whether psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, almost invariably find that the children pre- blame themselves for the situation. Mm. I'm treated this way because I'm bad. If I become good, I'll be treated better. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And various explanations have been offered uh, for this. The most common explanation is, well, children are naive. And the abusing adults, the abusing parents, whoever, convey to them that they are bad, and they, in their naivety, accept it at face value. And that's the source of that comprehension. Others uh, attribute, some others attribute to childhood narcissism. Children tend to believe that they are the source of everything in the world. They are the center of their world. And anything good or bad that happens to them is their doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, For what I believe is a more uh, accurate explanation of the phenomenon, one should consider that such children's existential predicament, if you will. They could either reconcile themselves that they are abused and are helpless in the face of that, which is essentially the closer closer to the truth, but endure that sense of hopelessness and helplessness, or they could decide that they are bad and endure that self-denigration that goes along with seeing oneself as bad, but preserve thereby the fantasy that if I only become good enough, Mm-hmm. Then my parents will cease abusing, cease abusing me, or whoever is, is the abuser mm-hmm. will cease, and uh, I will win relief. I am an agent in my situation, and I can act accordingly. Now, the similar thing uh, arose with, uh, if specifically we're talking about Israel, uh, building up to the Oslo agreements. Here they're under chronic siege, a siege which began. Even before the state of Israel, it began from the moment uh, the uh, uh, Ford uh, Declaration was issued in uh, 1917, and the uh, League of Nations subsequently endorsed it and called for a creation of a Jewish homeland and the Jews' ancestral homeland. And they were attacked, and they were attacked not only by the Arab population in, the, in what became the British Mandate, but in, by surrounding Arabs, verbally attacked, physically attacked by uh, by the Arabs in the, in the mandate in 2020, 21, massacres, 29, 36 to 39. And again, there were people then, there were somewhat marginal like people then who say, well, you know, we have to be more uh, accommodating of, the, of, the, of these people and they'll stop killing us or they'll stop attacking us. Uh, that was a, mi- a very much minority opinion, partly because as things proceeded, Israelis, or what became Israelis after independence, had hopes of other of events in ending the situation, re- resolving the situation. Just, uh, for example, they thought, well, once we attain statehood, once they attain statehood, well, then the hatred it will be a fait accompli, the hatred will end, and they'll reconcile to our being here. Well, that didn't happen. Then they said, well, the British instigated a lot of the hostilities. Once they leave the area, the hatred will end. That didn't happen. Then they said, well, it's the conservative autocrats that run the Arab world. And once there's some change in that, the uh, the, uh, intensity of the hatred will dissipate. 
And for example, when the kernels revolution happened in Egypt in 1952, that led ultimately to Nasser's gay power. And the kernels talked about uh, social socializing the Egyptian economy and dealing with internal problems. The Israelis thought, oh, this is great. They're turning to internal problems and they're going to be socialists and we're socialists because the first three decades of Israel had uh, social, social governments. And now the siege will end. Well, that didn't happen. Then the 67 war occurred and they said, well, they're going to want their land back. And so in exchange for land, they'll give us peace. And instead, shortly, some months after the war, you had the three no's of Khartoum. No, uh, negotiations. No recognition, no peace. So that didn't happen. And eventually, for some Israelis, there were, and particularly the Israeli elites, they were worn down by this absence of any advancement toward peace. And they decided, uh, there, there's one other major factor in this, they decided that we have to make, maybe they're right, maybe there's a reason, a justification for their hating us. We have to make concessions to win them, win them over. And one other factor, is that in 1977, for the first time in uh, Israel's history, and the socialists had run the pre, uh, pre-state pre Jewish community mm-hmm. in, in Israel as well. So from the 1920s until 77, there been socialists running the Jewish pre-state uh, community and the mm-hmm. Jewish state. For the first time, Likud, a right, a right of center government, was elected, and then, in the way, in the face of that, in the wake of that, the marginalized opinion that somehow it's our fault got increased credibility hmm. because people were seeing a government with which they did not identify running the country. They're saying, "Well, maybe these people are right. Maybe we didn't make the right concessions, and if only, and, and if only we went back to control, then we can make the concessions." And win peace. Now, this was an absurd belief. There was nothing, no factual basis for that. And the indictments were absurd, uh, totally unrelated to the actual history. But this is what people wanted to believe. Mm-hmm. Because, and again, mm-hmm. especially the elites, because the elites. the elites were aware not only of the attacks of the of the hatred emanating from Palestine, from the Arab world, and from the broader Muslim world. But it extended to uh, to the United Nations, of course, because the the Muslim bloc, fifty some nations, the largest bloc in the UN, it extended to Europe, who were worried about oil and trying to accommodate the Arabs in any way they could, and and anyway had their own issues with anti-Semitism, obviously. So the elites say we want to be part of this wider world. This mm-hmm. this conflict is preventing us from doing so, and so we have to resolve it. And then there were sort of intellectual accoutrements to this, uh, to this argument, to this shift in perspective, to this, uh, delusions of the, of the besieged. That is, they created a new history. They rewrote history. There was called the new history that put more blame on Israel. And it was factually grossly inaccurate. So some, some people said, well, what's, True in the new history is not new, and what's new in the new history is not true. <laughs> but it was it was essentially mm. claiming that uh, that the, the Arabs had reasonable grievances against the Jews. Now it's interesting that there are many scholars who criticize this new history, and in particular, what they noted particularly was in its description of. Uh, the War of Independence and subsequent events, uh, the Arab world was presented in very two-dimensional terms. It was very fl- flattened. Uh, and so all of our uh, all of our political decisions and decisions vis-a-vis Israel were a direct, predictable reaction to what Israel did or did not do. And people noted this and said, "Well, this isn't this isn't consistent with genuine history." Why are these historians doing this? And some said, well, uh, it's because clearly, the, now the historians themselves said it's because the Arab world is closed societies and there's not much information available to understand the nuances of Arab decision making. In fact, true, genuine scholars of the region, 
noted that there was a huge amount available. They are closed societies, but there was still a, a huge amount of the public domain. So the other, the, the critics of the new historian said, well, maybe they don't know, these people don't know Arabic that well, and they really <laughs> couldn't penetrate this literature effectively. And so that's why it's so two-dimensional. But no, there's a rhetorical reason why it's two-dimensional, because they intentionally want to present all of Arab actions as predictable results of Israeli actions. That is, they want to shift, even though, in fact, indeed, Israel is is the the part the party that doesn't have any impact on events genu- genuinely, and the active agents of the Arabs they want to present it the opposite way. The Arabs are simply reacting to whatever the Israelis do. So they did bad things, and that's why the situation is bad. If only they start doing good things, then it'll, it'll become better. And uh, of course, this is well, it's, it's simply nonsense. It's, it's the, totally divorced from reality, but it was the eagerness, particularly of the elites, to want to be able to end the siege and relate not only to the Arab world, but to the to the wider world that was going on with the Arabs, the Europeans, the State Department, the United Nations, uh, everyone, it seemed. And, uh, and so, in a sense, the pursuit of Oslo was a failure of all of Israel's elites, the academic elites, which signed on to all of this, the uh, journalistic elites, uh, the uh, political elites, and uh, the media elites. And this is what brought about Oslo in its inception. And it's noteworthy that on the very night of the famous handshake on the White, on the White House lawn, so you have Rabin reluctantly shaking hands with Arafat yeah. to start the Oslo process, right? It was seen around the world, right? And, and, and as I understand it, that night or the next day, uh, Arafat is speaking in um, in Arabic to to his followers about uh, don't yes. get worried about this. Uh, uh, my my philo- my theory my my my. Uh, 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 my projection of the future is that we're going to get everything we want and we'll get it by going to nego- negotiating whatever we can get and then going to war over the rest. Isn't that basically what happened? Exactly. He was broadcasting that evening on Jordanian television. That evening. Said to that, his, evening. that evening. That very evening. Yeah. And with Jordanian television saying that his Palestinian constituency and the wider Arab world should understand Oslo as the first stage in the 1974 plan of stages. That is a plan that was uh, put forward by the PLO for how to proceed. And that is, we'll gain whatever land we can by negotiations and use that land as a base for pursuing Israel's annihilation. He said that then, he repeated it about half a dozen times within four weeks of that speech. Mm -hmm. He did other things. He compared uh, Oslo to uh, a piece, the piece of Hudabaya, which... uh, and Muhammad had negotiated in the year 628 with a, another tribe, uh, made the ma- a major tribe. And uh, when, two years later, when he was strong enough, he just overwhelmed them, mm-hmm. uh, just and, defeated them. And, and, and he was and, constantly and, calling for jihad. And, and did the Israelis read that? I mean, did Rabin, who shook his hand and entered that agreement, didn't they understand that? Didn't they read that? They totally ignored it. They totally ignored it. And... Um, in fact, again, the media was as honest as our media are today. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, uh, they, there became an underground media evolved. Uh, groups like Memory, uh, Middle East Media Research Institute, and uh, Palestinian Media Watch, and, and a few others that monitored Palestinian media and Palestinian speeches and Palestinian textbooks. Uh, and report on this because none of the major media did so. But still, the people embracing Oslo ignored it. Okay, so one one theory that you're that the Oslo syndrome is sort of about it's making concessions and hope that they'll recognize uh, 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 that you'll be able to get along. In other words, it's wishful thinking. But it, another possibility isn't it possible that Israel continues to make concessions? Because they identify with the Palestinians not as oppressors, but because they identify with them as oppressed people, as the Jews have been. 
That's what the progressive Jews might think is the reason why Israel is making the concessions. Well, the the Palestinian the Palestinian leadership are not oppressed. First of all, the oppressors, as you pointed, the Palestinian leaderships, but also the the Israel, the wider Arab world mainly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, but they tried to focus narrowly on the Palestinians with the logic that well, if we can reconcile them or win them over, uh, then then uh, the wider Arab world will follow. That was the hope, and and peace will will prevail. But uh, of course, first of all, the, the Palestinian population does not have the same Palestinian politics, and the Palestinian leadership has always been a f- fomenters of genocidal anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was so. You had the leaders in the pre-state period. Haj Amin Al Hussein he was right. the leader of the Palestinians. He spent four years as a guest, of, right? Of Hitler's, he broadcast from Berlin throughout the war. Latter, um, from once he was in Berlin. Uh, to the Arab world in Arabic, urging them to support the Nazis and to kill Jews wherever they found them, basically. Mm-hmm. He was the head. He was allowed to live somehow, got out uh, after the war and got to the Middle East and was the head of Palestinian forces in the war uh, during the, Israel's War of Independence. The other, it was saying statements during the War of Independence that the end of this war is going to be the annihilation of the Jews. And while he was in Berlin, he talked with German officials, Nazi officials, with anticipating the ultimate conquest of uh, of the Holy Land by the Nazis, either when they were invading Russia, that they'd come through the Caucasus and, and get into Israel, or you know, Rommel's army would, would defeat the British in Egypt and move eastward, and how they were going to annihilate, where they were going to set up an extermination camp in Israel. Mm. And in the 67 war, before the 67 war, the same thing. This is a war of annihilation. Mm-hmm. Today, you have Hamas in its charter and stating explicitly not only that it's going to kill all the Jews in Israel, but it's going to kill all the Jews in the world. That's his objective. And uh, and PA says very simply, again, you have the slave uh, pay for slave policy where uh, Palestinians who kill Israelis, Israeli Jews are rewarded and awarded to, uh, an amounts that are proportional to how many Jews they kill. And they use taxpayer American money for doing this, to do this. Um, it was stopped by the previous administration, but Biden is giving it to them again. There was a Taylor Force Act passed that was supposed to stop Americans from uh, subsidizing this pay for slay. Uh, Biden's just going around it. Uh, and so the you're talking about the Palestinian people, but their rulers are this genocide and they the genocidal agenda. Mm-hmm. And they educate their people. Their, their media promotes it, their mosques promote it in sermons, and their schools promote it. The schools teach their children that uh, they ought to dedicate themselves to Israel's annihilation. Now uh, as a result, at this point, when the PA has been in place for three decades now, uh, much of the population has been educated in this and believes it. And much of the population that was against it uh, left. Palestinians left. The Palestinians say, well, we don't know. Those Palestinians, middle class, relatively educated people, said, uh, well, I, we don't want our children ed- educated to, that their highest goal in life should be to become a suicide bomber or a killer of Israelis and get and be martyred. And they just left the area with their children. Hmm. Uh, On a brighter note, uh, uh, the Trump administration was instrumental in forming important agreements, generally referred to as the Abraham Accords, that normalize relationships between Israel and four Arab countries the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. It appeared that we are finally moving beyond letting the Palestinian issue control foreign policy in Middle East countries. So, Ken, do you envision Saudi Arabia, one of the most important countries in the Middle East, normalizing relations with Israel? Well, Formally more normalizing, I don't know what a pay set will occur. It's clear that they do have contacts with Israel. They, uh, they have uh, relations with Israel, sub-Rosa. 
largely because obviously they're threat they feel threatened by Iran just mm-hmm. as Israel does and they see Israel as a potent backer capable of uh, of taking on Iran and helping them deal with Iran now uh the current administration has been somewhat first of all been very hostile to Saudi Arabia uh which is uh, creates difficulties then has been uh, wanting to cut deals with Iran mm-hmm. uh which likewise creates difficulties now in some ways uh, and it's also been hostile to Israel in, in various respects and in fact has been um accommodating in various respects to the Hezbollah uh, which is uh, obviously runs Lebanon basically as uh Iran's uh chief terrorist the protege uh and so to some degree you would think that perhaps with Israel uh, with the United States being less engaged in trying to limit Iran and and trying to cut deals with Iran that this might push Saudi Arabia and Israel even closer and it may be that may be going on again sub rosa mm-hmm. uh, on the other hand with the US seeing to pull back from the relationship with Israel uh might in some ways lead the, the Saudis to question the utility of drawing closer uh, to uh, to Israel. I think in general the the pull closer the pulling closer is the dominant or the or slow movement that we're seeing slow but the dominant the predominant movement. As you know, Israel is currently experiencing significant problems. I'm not speaking about the ever-present military challenges posed by Iran or the weekly terrorist attacks on civilians, but now I'm referring to the serious political divide between the current conservative government, led by Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the progressives on the left. It's almost a mirror image of what's happening in, in our country. I don't want to discuss today the very interesting and important details of that current controversy in Israel, but I do want to discuss with you, Ken, how Jews in our country are viewing and behaving in regard to that controversy. Ken, I'm totally puzzled by leftist Jews in America, which unfortunately are the majority of Jews in America, who increasingly side with Israel's detractors. A very important data point that which, which uh, supports my statement is that 70% of Jews voted for Obama twice, despite his obvious disdain for Israel. I'm hoping that as a trained and experienced psychiatrist that you can give me insight into this Oslo symptom-like behavior of the majority of Jews in our country who unfortunately side with Israel's detractors. What are the possible reasons for that seemingly masochistic behavior? And which reason of those do you think are most relevant today? Well, if I can give you some background, we've not discussed the diaspora at all so far. Uh, When I discuss the paradigm of the uh, abused child, Mm -hmm. An element of that, a relevant element, is that if the child has some other adult in, in his or her life that conveys a different message to the child, uh, a grandparent perhaps, an aunt and uncle, who says, no, this is your parents' problem. You are okay. You are okay. And that, that adult may not be able to extricate the child from the situation, but it could, that such a relationship often helps defend the child against what is commonly the subsequent difficulties in such children's lives, mm-hmm. where they go on to lives of self-abasement and self-denigration and misery, having grown up in this atmosphere where they were abused and where they blamed themselves for the abuse. So that that could help. That could make a big difference. On the, on the communal level, if you have communal institutions that convey a different message to, to the community, that no, and, and they, uh, we're okay, you're okay. They're the abusers, they're the evil ones, and we have, and we have a future, we have an integrity, we have, 
right on our side and we have a future, then that could help defend communities against the uh, delusions of the abuse, so to speak. Now, for various historical reasons having to do with the emergence of modern nation states, uh, Jewish institutions were dramatically weakened over the last two and a half centuries with the, with the emergence of modernity, emergence of, of modern states. And so they had less defenses against this. And as you saw in the early 19th century, as big governments in Central Europe were beginning to consider present uh, extending civic rights to Jews. There were various indictments by the anti-Semites against the Jews why such rights shouldn't be ex extended. Mm -hmm. And every one that was brought up had Jewish defenders of the, of the indictments. So it was said, for example, oh, um, Jews are too much engaged in trade and trades a nefarious occupation. The, the only honest trade is farming. And, uh, hmm. and it, this is unwholesome and that disqualifies them for equal rights, civic rights. And there were Jews who said, right, Jews ought to become uh, farmers, farmers okay. instead of being engaged in trade. Now, there were other people at the same time, else, not in Central Europe, the British uh, author Joseph Addison talked about how the world economy is depending on Jews are kind of like the, the spokes and the wheels that keep trade going and keep the economies going, even though they're not acknowledged as such and very positive about the Jews' role. The American uh, George Mason, uh, you know, a writer of the Constitution, uh, uh, particularly the uh, involved in writing the uh, well, the uh, Bill of Rights, said similar things about Jews. This was not the case in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. And so Jews took it to heart and said, well, if we give up trade, maybe anti-Semitism will end. <laughs> Other people said, well, Jews speak Yiddish, and it's, and it's a deformed, uh, unwholesome language that reflects the degeneracy of the Jews, and that's why Jews shouldn't be, shouldn't be given rights. And uh, Jews, some Jews said, we'll okay, up, we have to learn Yiddish. proper German. <laughs> and then, <laughs> all right, but learn proper German, get rid of Yiddish, and then we'll be accepted. Mm -hmm. It's all delusional. Another thing, and this is relevant to the Israel situation too, is that they were said, well, Jews are a separate nation. And uh, this is a separate nation. Why should they have civic rights in our nation? And some Jews in German speaking countries, Develop reformist congregations mm -hmm. that explicitly excluded yearning for Zion, yearning for Jerusalem from the liturgy in order to propitiate these haters. I said, well, and it's it's worth noting that whenever these people were accommodating the haters, they didn't say, "Oh, we're doing this to uh, to assuage the you know, Semites." They said, "We're doing it for higher moral purposes." Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. So, for example, those who uh, are reforming the liturgy saying, well, you know, the thirst for return to Zion and all that's primitive. That's, uh, you know, we, we're now uh, purely religious people, not a, we're not a nation. And, uh, and we have to bring Judaism's message to the wider world. That's our, that's our mission in the world. And it's atavistic to think about returning to Zion. You know, they, they can't say not that well, we're trying to... Uh, placate the anti-Semites who were indicting us for being a nation. And so you had anti-Zionism preceding Herzl, preceding Zionism by mm. decades. Mm. I didn't know that. So this kind of thing... Now, one second, does that still hold in reform uh, uh, temples uh, in the United States, for example? Do they not well, refer it, to Israel? It is... The, the short answer is yes, to some degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the reformist congregations brought their comprehension of things to America with them. In, in 1888, there was a form of uh, Pittsburgh platform, which explicitly stated, we have no interest in returning to Zion. Oh. We have this international mission, religious mission, not a national mission. We have no interest in it. And uh, they repeated that subsequently. Now, among Reformed congregants, that changed somewhat uh, with... Uh, with the Shoah, 
with the um, uh, it began to change even before between the world wars there was a lot of anti-Semitism. All the the new governments and the new states in Eastern Europe were typically fascist governments in one way or another, with very few exceptions, and they were uh, xenophobic and they were against all the minorities in, in within their borders. And the Jews were minority, obviously, in all the borders, and they were under difficulty. So at that point, even you know, the reform reform congregations began to, and there, at this point, of course, Israel's the, the national home for the Jewish people had been not only proposed by Britain, but had been endorsed by the League of Nations, and the, and the uh, mandate had been created. Uh, at that point, they said, "Well, we should have a national home there." But they did not, and they said there was a Columbus platform in 1937 on the reform in America. Uh, okay, national homes so people could have refuge there who were suffering in Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. but not a nation. Mm-hmm. But not a nation. I see. Why didn't they want a nation? That's it because they thought that if there was a nation of Israel, it would undermine their rights and all the wherever their rights were tentative, or mm-hmm. uh, and that was all over the world in the 30s. I mean, mm-hmm. there was a lot of anti-Semitism in the, in the states in the 30s. The Jews couldn't get jobs. Jews couldn't get an education. Jews couldn't live in a lot of areas. And they thought that would be even worse if there was a Jewish nation. They'll say, well, go to Israel. Mm-hmm. Get out of here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in England, after Balfour issued his uh, de- declaration, most, much of the opposition came from Eng- British Jews. They say, we, you, we fought for these rights in England, and what will happen if there's a Jewish nation? Will they kick us out of here? Mm-hmm. But they didn't say we have to accommodate these haters. They said, we have a higher purpose. Now. I see. I see. So it, and it, that I'm, carried on in the states, and you see this the, the same thing. So the reform, once Israel a fait accompli, and after the Holocaust, certainly Reform Congress by and large became Zionist, became pro-Zion. But as Israel has come under fire in this country, particularly under fire from groups in this country with with which elite Jews. Many Jews identified. identified. Yeah. That is academics, the media, the uh, cultural elites, the, uh, and so forth, the, uh, and so forth. They want to distance themselves from Israel. Mm-hmm. And uh, but the but the what you brought up is also a response, a particular, reflects particular responses to this besiegement. There are other some elements uh, that let me mention that will go to this more directly. Another indictment was that Jews are too parochial. Yeah, they're focused on their own community. An answer to that was, well, we have to demonstrate to them that we're not. So we have to extend ourselves to a broader, a broader community, mm-hmm. even at the cost of ignoring yeah. disabilities that are particular to Jews. And even acknowledging some of those broader communities that are anti-Semitic. That's right. Well, because where you get another element of it is we have to, for Jews to be safe, they have to embed themselves in a larger constituency. Mm -hmm. And this is thinking of it in categorical terms. What I mean by categorical terms is wanting to believe that, in general, the extension of rights to Jews in Europe, in Central Europe, uh, was supported more by liberal and elsewhere in Europe, more by liberal forces than conservatives. And that's not across the board. There were plenty of liberals against it. There were conservatives who were sympathetic to it. But in general, that was. And uh, in the German states, Germany was divided until 1871 into, um, um, into a number of states. Uh, liberals were for unification. Unification of Germany was a liberal agenda for economic reasons. So uh, to get rid of tariffs that existed between German states, to do away with the economic privileges accorded the nobility in these small states and so forth. And uh, Jews were interested in uh, Germany because they saw the liberals were for it and they thought they had a better chance of getting rights. And the jury rights were extended to them in the United Germany. But they thought... In categorical terms, they wanted to believe that this relationship with the liberals was transcendent, would exist forever. Mm-hmm. It's a very simplistic 
and very unsophisticated political mm-hmm. comprehension. So it dates way back. Political. It dates way back. It uh, dates way back, and the, it's the same, and it and it, it, it's extended here as well. Right. There, uh, um, no, there's uh, uh, in preparing for this. Uh, uh, for our meeting tonight, uh, I read that the Los Angeles Times conducted a survey in 1988. Now, that's 35 years ago, quite a while back. And it found when Jews were asked which among three facets of Jewish identity they most valued, social justice or Israel or the Jewish religion, there were three things that are, are, are part of being Jewish, according to the uh, L.A. Times. And it gave people the question, which of these is most valued? Fifty percent chose the pursuit of social justice and equality over supporting Israel or over the importance of the Jewish religion. That was 35 years ago, and it's probably much worse today. That's, that's right. And... Um... The social justice issue, give you a, a, another example of that. Uh, in 1997, when the, now the, these are called JCRC, Jewish Community Relations Councils, which exists all over the country, in, in, in cities all over the country. And their purpose is to, in a sense, is to counter this uh, indictment of parochialism by demonstrating how we have wider interests, we have we want the good of the wider community, and they pursue it even at the cost mm-hmm. of even to the detriment of particularly Jewish issues with the wider community may be attacking mm-hmm. 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 and and minorities that the Jews are helping in the context of the social justice may be attacking Jews, and they ignore that, but. An example, in 1997, in the midst of Oslo, even though Oslo was losing some of its panache because, in fact, after Arafat arrived in the territories, uh, the uh, number of terrorist killings went up very significantly. But uh, this this was going on. A lot of Israelis were having second of the polls of Israelis showing they were turning against Oslo. But the Jewish Community Relations Councils mm-hmm. in America mm-hmm. and their umbrella group were saying, well, now peace is coming to Israel so we can refocus ourselves on social justice issues. This I, was yeah. the line of the JCRCs, and including the Indianapolis JCRCs. So the Jews, Indianapolis did a poll of Jews in, in the city, and they totally disagreed. They said they don't trust Arafat, peace isn't coming. Yeah. It would be suicidal for, for Israel to give more land to Arafat and so forth. And there is this gap between the uh, organized community, right, right, the, estab- the establishment community, and individuals. And even you're right about Obama, and most Jews are on the left still. But it's noteworthy that to some degree, some of that polling is done by very left wing mm-hmm. Jewish and other organizations. And in fact, for example, a Florida vote, Trump might have gotten fifty percent, approximately. He did very well in Ohio with, of Jews. It made a difference in both those states, and his capturing those states probably made a difference. But in general, you're right. But is this all? It's this all uh, uh, comprehension. And another a re- a related thing, going back several decades, just as your example from the L.A. Times, which is absolutely correct. Uh, there was Seymour Martin Lipset and another one. Famous, well-established sociologists and other who were doing something about the state of the Jewish community in America, and noted that the vast majority of Jews believe that conservatives are more anti-Semitic in America than liberals, even though Ridiculous. no evaluation of no polling of American opinion vis-a-vis Jews demonstrates that difference. This is the comprehension of, of Jews. Yeah, but it's and, based on these. And uh, a go- uh, I think a good example of a bad thing happening is Hillel, which was established to support Jewish uh, 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 Jewish uh, students in universities around the country, a place for them to go and meet and whatever, um, is now be- has been over the years changed quite dramatically. It was a conservative pro-Israel organization. And now there's something called Open Hillel. So you have more, you know, you spend more time looking at this issue than I have. Uh, 
when did this transformation start and, and what is the status today of Hillel? Well, Hillel, the issue is that the left in America, the, 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 the progressive left, has become more and more anti-Semitic. The major institutional, home of anti-Semitic, the major anti-Semitic institution in the United States today is academia, mm -hmm. which is totally controlled by the left. Now, again, the problem is Jews, many Jews identify with academia, you know, with education, academia, and are reluctant to attack it, to acknowledge it. And, ma and major uh, organizations the old establishment organizations have generally not addressed this issue. Now, Hillel is interesting. The it's an it, international Hillel has a very strong statement in its uh, mission statement uh, about uh, being pro-Israel and not uh, affiliating or not cooperating with anti-Israel efforts. But the Individual Hillel chapters are uh, are very much autonomous. They're not funded generally by the International Hillel. They're funded by local alumni, largely, and uh, and there are many of them where the rabbis, the heads of the Hillels, are anti-Israel, hmm. and either they came to the to the university or college that way. Or they were won over to it because that's the ethos on the campuses, mm -hmm. and uh, and when I say came to it that way, you see it in the you see it in the seminaries that are producing, you know, the, the seminaries of silver are, pro are producing uh, rabbis who are against Israel because the seminaries, the leaders of the people running them, to some degree identify even though they're jewish seminaries identify more with the broader academic world mm -hmm. and want to accommodate them and want to be in sync with them mm -hmm. then focusing on jewish interests so you get probably more often than not heads of hillels local heads of hillels who won't fight the fight on campuses even though their, their students are under siege mm -hmm. on many many campuses they won't fight the fight now Again, they have a fair amount of autonomy. And the Open Hillel was, you had these very anti-Israel groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, which is essentially is called for the dissolution of Israel. Yeah. Well, or J Street, 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 which Street. hasn't done that, but an effort is all its policies are anti-Israel policies. And the Open Hillel concept was, well, we have to let these people into Hillel as well. Because we want a big tent, we want to present all Jews. If they want to be affiliated with the community to be part of Hillel, we should let them. Of course, that's nonsense. They want to be part of the community so they can subvert the Hillel chapters to sure. so their ways of thinking. There's no open JCR, uh, uh, CG, uh, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, J, uh, J, JVP chapters. They're not open to other opinions. Or students JCR for justice in Palestine isn't uh, interested right. in other people. Exactly. Exactly. Right. You, so, you well, don't what, form an organization. Uh, and invite people who want to destroy the organization or, or the reason yeah. enough of the organization for being. Exactly. Right. So, but what International Hill could do is say to these groups, these open hills, well, you can't use the hill all name. That's right. That's right. No, it has and not, 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 and it, they fail to do that. It's so not a funding thing, but they should be able to take away the name Hillel. You know, so that, no. that's so the problem. So when property. I get my... Uh, and the mail request for funds to International Hill, well, it goes directly into the circular file. You know, it's sure. I'm the because same. Because they're failing. They're failing the Jewish community. As you've recently uh, heard, uh, we're talking about uh, the problems uh, that uh, that exist now among Jews, leftist Jews, and conservative Jews, both in Israel and in the U.S. Lots of problems. Uh, but you know, those problems are historical, too. They started a long time ago. I'm going to quote you. Theodor Herzl, a Jewish journalist and political activist in the late 1800s, he is known as the father of modern Zionism, the movement for the establishment of a, of a homeland for the Jewish people in the land that is now called Israel. In his groundbreaking essay entitled The Jewish State, 
Theodor Herzl noted that his proposal for a Jewish state would inevitably face numerous objections. He observed, and I quote, Perhaps we shall have to fight first of all against many evil-disposed, narrow-hearted, short-sighted members of our own race. Unfortunately, it seems that he had, Theodore Herzl was right. Jews have, throughout our 3,000-year history, prevailed over our external enemies. But can, can we prevail over ourselves? Well, you're absolutely right about history. Uh, that, uh, and Herzl was right about what we face. And there are times in the past when we did not prevail against our uh, over our internal divisions. But in this instance, despite all the difficulties we face, external and internal, and major internal difficulties for the to the creation of Israel, the state was created. It's prospering. It's prospering beyond the wildest dreams of anybody there at their creation. And uh, and I'm hopeful for the future as well. Ken. Thank you for spending time with me today to share your insights into the challenges faced by Jews, both in Israel and here in America. And thank you again, Bob. Very, very much enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob, please subscribe and you'll be automatically notified of future podcasts in this series. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Life Lessons with Dr. Bob. If you enjoy these interviews with some of today's most influential thought leaders, please follow and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, you can also watch each episode on YouTube as well. We'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate reading your comments on YouTube and social media, and now you can submit your questions on my website as well. Head over to lifelessonswithdrbob.com and click the question tab at the top of the page or the one on the right side of the screen, and let us know what's on your mind. I'll answer your questions at the beginning of each episode, so let it rip. Let's have some fun.